Hello out there in Radio Land. This is Michael. This is the Street Preacher's Corner Podcast. The podcast where we may not uh, shake, rattle, and roll. We definitely sometimes babble, stutter, and stammer. Before we get into the Bible study, which we're going to call Mark Lesson uh, 13, looks like, uh, I want to talk to you about something that is absolutely not particularly spiritual at all. Uh, I, just, I, just, I just think it's interesting, and presumably, if I think it's interesting, someone else will as well. I am a conspiracy guy. There's no, no need denying it. And the real harm, you know, there's no real harm in being a, a conspiracy guy, especially since if the last three or four years have proved anything, uh, we're right. All the cotton picking time, we're right. How many things, think of it, you're listening to this at whatever point, it is, it is 2023. How many times, in the, 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 the things three years ago that they said where you were crazy for believing and that, that you weren't even allowed to say uh, on, on, on public platforms because it was dangerous misinformation uh, that, that turned out a couple of years down the road to have been 100% true and the people that told you you couldn't talk about it knew it was true. And so one of the advantages of being a conspiracy guy is that uh, you're right eventually. I mean, about most things. Now, uh, having said that, I don't believe everything I read. I don't believe everything I hear. My personal rabbit hole, my personal thing that I get overly obsessed about is the assassination of John F. Kennedy because it has fascinated me. It's fascinated me my entire life that somebody said, hey, we'll shoot the president in the head uh, in front of of thousands of people in broad daylight, and we will, by all indicators, get away with it. And here it is 60 years later, and we still don't know everything we need to know. And so in my interest in the Kennedy assassination, I have read thousands of pages of things. I've listened to hundreds of hours of, of interviews with everybody involved. Um, I, have, I know so much about it, I forgot a lot of what I know. And, um, and, and, then, and then one thing you find out about the Kennedy assassination is there's always more to know. There's always one more thing. There's always one more something that you didn't know about. <clears throat> And none of us saying all that is even true that I've been told or that I've read. But I've got, I don't know, I've probably got a dozen books uh, or have had a dozen books over the years, paper books about about the assassination. And one of the last ones, uh, the latest ones that I picked up was by the Secret Service agent uh, that was assigned to Mrs. Mrs. Kennedy, a fellow by the name of Clint Hill. And uh, it's it's interesting, but, you know, everybody that reads this, so he, was a, he was a Secret Service agent. He was assigned to Mrs. Uh, Kennedy. From you know when her husband took office till uh, presumably the rest of her life, uh, because uh, you know a first lady still gets Secret Service protection if she wants it. And um, but everybody that buys this book buys it for the same reason they buy it because of the the uh, uh, chapter on the assassination. If you watch the Zapruder film, which has its own interesting story, um, Clint Hill is the guy that runs up and jumps on the back of the limousine and pushes Mrs. Kennedy back into her seat. That's the guy that wrote this book. And there's a couple of things that are really obvious from me, uh, to me anyway. One is that he is possibly inordinately fond of Mrs. Kennedy. I won't say he's in love with her, but I will say that he's in love with her. Um, and the other thing is that this book has been very carefully vetted when it comes to the events of November 1963. And I will, I will explain to you this, uh, and, and I'm, I know I'm taking up too much time for this, but it'll be okay. So the way that worked, uh, and I could do a whole thing on the, the assassination from memory or uh, with all the source material I have, but really this is not what we're here to do. I just want to tell you, I, I, I'm going to tell you this whole story because I'm going somewhere with it. Okay, so so the way this worked was, uh, you know, there was the, there was the, there was the presidential limousine, uh, where Mr. Kennedy was sitting on the right-hand side and Mrs. Kennedy was sitting on the left-hand side. Governor Connolly and Mrs. Connolly were sitting in front of them and then the Secret Service agents, uh, uh, Bill Greer, was driving and uh, and all that great stuff. And so Mr. Hill, uh, the per- the guy that wrote this book and the guy that was assigned to Mrs. Kennedy, he was in the he was in the car behind them. Uh, he was on, the, on a running board hanging onto the side of the car. And during the course of the motor- motorcade, he was very concerned that somebody from the crowd could run out into the street and they would, you know, be able to get to Mrs. Kennedy before he could. So he would ride in the back car. The the back the, the backup car uh, was five feet back behind. That was they were supposed to say five feet behind the the main the, the presidential motorcade or the presidential limousine. He's riding on this backup car. Occasionally he will jump off the car, run up to where the president's limousine is, and jump on the back of the president's limousine. There's a little little perch back there. 
President Kennedy had requested that that not happen. But when they got to spots where the crowd was really uh, pressing in, um, Clint Hill decided on his own that he would stay close to Mrs. Kennedy when the crowd got thick. And when the crowd thinned out, he would fall back so that Kennedy could... They, the Kennedy did not, want, not, did not want to appear that he was surrounded by armed guards all the time. He wanted to appear accessible. So, so the way he tells the story in this book is he was riding on the backup car. He heard a shot. He jumped off the backup car. He started running towards the limousine. He, uh, well, he said he heard the first shot. He said it was coming from behind him. He runs towards the limousine. He never hears the second shot, and then he hears the third shot just as he gets covered with brain matter and blood and bone from from President Kennedy's head. And that lines up, that testimony lines up with what we can see in the films, the different films that we have of the assassination. That timing lines up. He's He gets up there, you know, Mrs. Kennedy is trying to scoop up pieces of her husband's head, and, 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 and Clint Hill pushes her back into the seat tells Bill Greer, get us to the hospital, and they speed off and he, with, with, with uh, Clint Hill riding in the back, or sitting in the back. He actually, at one point, he actually climbs up and he's kind of uh, holding his body up over the top of Mrs. Kennedy so that if there's, a, you know, more shots coming, he, he'll take them instead of her. So, so that's it. So, he, so he, he hears the shot. He thinks it's behind him. He runs towards. He misses the second shot. He didn't hear it at all. Uh, and then in the third shot, he gets sprayed with, blank, with brain matter. So then there's all the stuff going on with the assassin, all the stuff going on with the autopsy, all the stuff going on with the body being moved. Like I said, there's a whole thing you could do about this. People have done whole things about this. Uh, but then I'm looking at the part of the book where he talks about, uh, at one point, after they, after they flew the body to Bethesda, Maryland, and the, uh, the Navy doctors did a, an official autopsy on the president, um, they... Uh, Clint Hill is brought in by the doctor that did the autopsy to explain to him what ha- for to, for the doctor's going to explain to Clint Hill, Agent Hill, how how this happened, so that if the Mrs. Kennedy has any questions, as her personal security, she would probably talk to Clint Hill first, was the logic, and so he needed to be able to tell her something. Okay, so that's the, so 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 that's the scene I want to paint in your mind. He is being brought into where the auto, the body, the body of the president of the United States is laying there, cut open, and and just you know all that stuff. And he's being brought in, and, and the and the uh, says uh, about two forty five. The phone rang. It was Roy Kellerman. Clint, we need you to come down to the autopsy room. Yes, sir. I'll be right down. I left the seventeenth floor with Paul in charge and went to the autopsy room. As I approached the door, Kellerman stepped out and said, "Clint, before the autopsy is closed, I need you to come in and view the president's body." I know that this isn't going to be easy, but we decided that since you're the closest to Mrs. Kennedy, it is important for you to see the body in case she has any questions. And he goes in. Bill Greer is there. Dr. Berkeley is there. General Godfrey McHugh, President Kennedy's Air Force aide. Um, uh, Clint Hill says he doesn't remember the name of the doctor that actually briefed him, which is fine. The man, this is the doctor, gently lowered the sheet just enough to expose the president's neck, and he began describing the wounds to me, a wound in the front neck area where, could, where a tracheometry, tracheotomy had been performed at Parkland Hospital in an effort to revive the president. He said it covered an exit wound. Then rolling the president gently over to one side, he pointed out a wound in the upper back of the neckline, quite small. This, he said, was the entry wound that corresponded to the exit wound at the throat. So the doctor's position is, President Kennedy was shot from behind, Went in through his back, came out through his throat. Moving the back uh, body back and slightly left, he pointed out the wound in the upper right rear of the head. I swallowed hard, listening closely as the doctor explained what had happened. It appeared that the impact of the bullet hitting the president's head was so severe, it caused an explosive reaction within the makeup of the skull and brain, so that portions of the brain erupted outward, and a portion of the skull, with skin and hair attached, became like a flap. You drop down another paragraph or so. This is Clint Hill speaking. He says, yes, doctor, I said, that is exactly what happened. I know. I saw it. I was five feet from the president when the impact occurred. I don't believe Clint Hill is a dishonest man. I do believe this book was obviously vetted before it was allowed to be published. But what Clint Hill or no one else can explain how you can shoot a man uh, from the back and it hits the back of his head and it ejects brain matter towards the shot. That's not how bullets work. You shoot a man in the front of the head, 
and it ejects brain matter out the back, that makes sense. So, so here's what I'm saying. Is it, is it, uh, Clint Hill, obviously I, I had no reason to doubt his honesty. I had no reason to doubt his, his sincerity. This book is full of very touching anecdotes about, about Mrs. Kennedy and the children and, and their domestic life. And I would say that Clint Hill was around her more than her husband was for about four years. And so, uh, I, I don't doubt his sincerity or his affection for the people in the book, but I believe that he was told what the, tr- what the official story was and he decided to go along with it. So my point in all that is that even in eyewitnesses, uh, even with, you have to be careful. You have to think about what you're reading and you have to think about that maybe the person that is repeating something to you is repeating what they were told to repeat. Okay? And uh, Mark chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 40. And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Now, it's interesting to me about this, that this leper fellow was out walking around in town. He was out, he was out in the general population. And that's not supposed to happen. There are rules about these things in ancient Israel. And uh, he's, he's supposed to be outside the camp. He's supposed to be in the, in the little area they had set aside for lepers. And if he has to come out in town, he has to proclaim to everybody that he's a leper. He has to proclaim to everybody that he's unclean. He has to call it out as he's going down the street. So the people know to stay away from him. And that I don't know that he was calling out, but I do know he was here in town. And he ran into Jesus. And even though you and I are not healed from leprosy, I think in this, in, in this instance of this leper being healed, there are some amazing typologies because the physical healings that Jesus Christ did were uh, physical manifestations of the spiritual healing of the larger truth. It is no big deal to heal a man of leprosy. I mean, they can... I'm pretty sure they can do that now with medicine, doctors, and, and whatever. They can heal a lot of things now they couldn't heal before. All, the, all they lacked was the skill set to do so. So to heal a man is not that big a deal, uh, especially for, for God being manifest in the flesh. But that, that physical heal that took place was, was symbolic. It was a, something you could see. It was a visual representation of a larger healing that would take place in the lives and hearts and souls of men who would be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ and have their sins put away. And I'm telling you that that typology is holds up. If you look closely at this entire interchange with this leper, that typology holds up and it holds up like, I mean, holds up like a champ, man. It just, and I will go through it. So the leper was out walking around. That's interesting. He's supposed to be outside the camp. When the leper gets there, it said, the Bible says that he knelt, uh, kneeling down to him. So he knelt. That was, that was a, that's a physical depiction of humility. The Bible says a humble and contrite, a humble, I'm going to mangle this verse. We're going to go for it. Uh, a broken heart and a humble and contrite spirit will I not refuse or something to that effect. A man who comes to Jesus Christ, come, that, comes to him, that comes to him in arrogance, comes to him in, in self-righteousness, that man does not get an audience. But a man who comes to him and kneels the knees of his heart or kneels the knee, kneels, bows the knee of his heart or bows the knee of his knee, uh, that man can get God's attention. That man can get can get can get some help from God, and that was true for this leper, and it's also true for for the sons of men, for men in general. Uh, then he says, he says, uh, uh, "If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. If thou wilt, it is a remarkable statement because it reflects a confidence this leper has in Jesus Christ's ability. It's almost the same mentality." That Christ had uh, in Gethsemane. I'm not trying to say the leper is like Jesus, but I will say that there is a mentality of a, a reservation to the will of of the Lord, whether that Lord be the Lord Jesus Christ or you know God the Father. Uh, there's a resignation uh, to God's will that you see in in Christ's life, and you see it just very briefly in the life of this leper. Because when Christ is in Gethsemane, Gethsemane, he says, you know, if it be possible, this cup be taken from me, uh, but nevertheless, Thy will be done. So this man came to Jesus and said, you know, if you if you want to, you you could make me clean. If thou wilt, uh, thou canst make me clean. He had no doubt Jesus Christ had the had the ability, he had no doubt Jesus Christ had the authority, he had complete confidence and faith in Jesus Christ. But that confidence and, and faith has to be based on something. And I've said this before, and I'm pro- I'll probably say it again before it's over with. Uh, sometimes the lost world, sometimes the world of skeptics 
Well, it's what they would call religious people. When they say religious people, they don't mean, uh, you know, Buddhists and Muslims. They, they mean uh, they mean Bible believing Christians. And they they have this uh, this 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 mindset that what we have is this sort of pie in the sky uh, theology sort of thing where we just decide to believe something and if we just decide to believe it. We just flip a switch in our brain. And they 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 say to themselves, they say, well, I don't I don't have that sort of switch in my brain where I can just believe uh, absurd things. And where they miss the boat is that biblical faith is not blind faith. Bible says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Your faith to be legitimate Bible faith has to have a substance to it. It can't just be this, uh, you know, uh, as Mike Easter says, a hope is not a wish. Uh, It can't be that I wish this would happen. I wish the world worked this way. I wish there was an invisible sky genie in there that heard me when I prayed. You have to have, for it to be biblical faith, you have to have something. You have to have some sort of evidence. There has to be. It has to be based on something. It can't just be you sat down one day and made up this nonsense. And I'm going to put my confidence in it. And then, and that's, and that's that. But that, that's not what people that believe the Bible do. I mean, maybe some of them do. But if you talk to people that really believe the Bible, what you'll find is they are some of the most skeptical people you've ever met in your life. They don't believe nothing. And that that serves them well because the Bible tells us to try all things and to prove all things. But the reason, this leper believed Jesus Christ could heal him because Jesus Christ had healed others. So every time you look in the Bible, and I should, I should get around one of these days and just do a whole thing on faith. But uh, uh, what you'll find in the Bible is that every time God tells someone to put their confidence in him, uh, every time God requests or asks or commands or whatever, whatever verb you want to use there uh, for people to put their confidence in him, he always refers back to something he's, always, he's already done. He doesn't say, just believe me just because I said so. He say, believe me because I'm the one that brought you out of Egypt. Believe me because I'm the one that struck Pharaoh down. But believe me because I'm the one that parted the Red Sea. And uh, so here, this, this leper, he, he looked around at other lepers who had been healed, and he said, that guy can heal me. His faith was based on evidence, and so was ours. Our faith is, is not only based on the assurity of the scriptures that are that are backed up by fulfilled prophecy. Our our, our, our faith is based on uh, uh, the, the the surety of the scriptures, based on the fact that men uh, put their testimony to paper about what they saw in, in their dealings with Jesus, and then those men paid for that testimony with their very lives. Uh, our, our our faith is based on our faith has evidence for it. It's not wishful thinking. So a lost man, I don't know if you ever invite anybody to church or, or any kind of witnessing anybody. I'm not a big fan of inviting lost people to church, although I guess it's it's better than doing nothing. But sometimes when you'll invite a lost guy to church, he'll say something like, oh, if I go in there, the building will fall in, or I'll go in there, the place will burn down, or if I go in there, lightning will hit the building. And a lost man who says that is, is uh, he ignores a lot of evidence to get there because he's trying to be a smart aleck or, or because of whatever. Um one of the things, that, a lost man who says that Christ can't save him, he ignores the evidence of the sort of men who Christ has already saved. What you ought to do sometime, and you don't know everything about everybody around you, and you shouldn't know everything about everybody around you, but you should just sit down at a church one day and look around and think about the people that are in that building and think about what you know about them and then think about what God knows about them. And think, God saved that guy, and God saved that guy, and God saved that girl, and God saved me. <clears throat> My sister, who, as far as I know, was lost, come to church with us uh, here recently. She was in town. She agreed to come to church. She got there after the church service was over, but at least she showed up. I guess you got to take your victories where you can. She showed up for the meal. She didn't show up for the service. Anyway. And but when we were telling her how you ought to come to church while you're in town, you should come to church with us. She said, "Oh yeah, if I go in there, the building will fall in." And I said, "If it didn't fall in on me, it's not going to fall in on you." And she said, "Yeah, yeah that's a good point." I'm like, wait, 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 you know, you're supposed to say no. You're a good person, Michael. Anyway, so a lost man who says Christ can't save me ignores the evidence of the sort of men that Christ has already saved. Christ will save the reprobate. Christ will save the drunkard. Christ will save the wife beater. Christ will save the pervert. Christ will save the liar. Christ will save the self righteous. If they'll quit putting, if they'll stop that, put, quit putting their trust in those things they put their trust in, and put their trust in what he did on the cross of Calvary, he'll save them. And the evidence of that is that Christ has been saving men 
by the tens of thousands, by the millions, for 2,000 years. And uh, that's just how that works. And by the same token, a, a saved man who, who, who feels like he can't get the victory, he ignores the evidence uh, of, of the sort of victories God gives, has given other people. And uh, I'm probably just preaching to myself at this point. But anyway, verse 41 says, And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him, and said to him, I will be thou clean. So Jesus' motive is his, is his compassion. The Bible says, for God so loved the world. Jesus Christ, God the Father, the Holy Spirit, they're motivated by their love and by their compassion for the sinner. God could have been just and damned the entire race. He would have been right for doing so. And, and, and it wouldn't have been that you and I got a raw deal. It would have been that we got what we deserve. But moved by compassion, he says, I will. Now that's different from the I will that you see in Isaiah 14 when the devil says, I will be like the most high, I will ascend above God's throne, I will, I will, I will, the five I wills in Isaiah 14. Because he says he's going to do those things, and he can't. As my grandfather used to say, it ain't bragging if you can do it. And so Jesus says, I will be thou clean. And uh, uh, verse 42 says, uh, and as soon as he had spoken, Immediately, the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed. Now, it's interesting that uh, um, that once del- once Jesus delivers a man, it happens all at once. There's no there's no you know installment plan of healing. Uh, and, and I'm saying that with t- tongue in cheek. I, I, I you know I, I I look at too much stupid stuff uh, from time to time. Uh, but I heard a faith healer say once that uh, even the you know he healed a man of, of arthritis or some some such thing. And uh, he, had, he had said as a caveat, you know, to cover his behind because he's a liar and a charlatan, charlatan um, he said, well, he said the, the healing is immediate, but the symptoms may linger. But every time in the Bible you see God healing a man, the, the symptoms is what goes away. Because how else would you know that you've been healed if the symptoms didn't go away? And so that, that, that installment thing, uh, you know, I mean, really, if a guy, I don't know how a man can stand there. Uh, flat-footed, and, and, and uh, you know, being dishonest is one thing, but being an idiot is another. And uh, I would say about a guy like that, he's a chucklehead, and he's a maroon, as Bugs Bunny would say, and he ought to be uh, ashamed of himself for being so dumb. He ought to be ashamed, be ashamed of himself for being so dishonest. Uh, and so there's that. So I'm moving around a little, here, a little bit here. Um, you know, we don't, we, don't, uh, we don't have a regular TV kind of thing. Uh, we got way too much... Uh, media to be honest with you i really would like to live in a house of no electricity and and stuff but anyway it's probably not gonna happen because i gotta I got live with other people but um we don't have like regular broadcast tv well sometimes we'll to go stay at a hotel room of course there'll be a tv there and and uh i'll, I'll try to find spongebob squarepants to watch because spongebob squarepants is always on somewhere in a hotel room tv so i think there's a 24-hour spongebob channel out there somewhere but anyway, so we're we're flipping channels and we find this uh, this faith healer kind of service going on. This one is uh, you know these TV preacher kind of guys that I cannot stand because they they tend to be dishonest. And this particular fellow, I don't really I don't know this story has anything to do with anything. But um, this particular guy, he had this. Uh, They're trying to raise a bunch of money because you know why not, right? And this is trying to raise this money, and he's got this. Uh, you ever seen like a telethon for PBS or something? They'll have the they'll have the guy talking, and behind him they have all these people in like bleacher kind of things with phones and they're answering the phone and they're taking taking money from people so this this guy i won't call him a preacher uh really because he, he wasn't but he was telling people on the tv that uh that uh that they would they need to be one of gideon's 300 is what they're calling you need to call here you need to pledge 300 dollars because we're gonna this is our program we're calling it gideon's 300 and you pledge 300 dollars and what we will do and they had this big humongous clay pot like uh i don't know it's probably uh, four foot tall, sitting on a little pedestal. And he said, we'll take this Sharpie and we get our your $300. We will write your name on this clay pot. This alabaster pot is what he called it. Alabaster. Because you got to throw those Bible words there. You can't just say it's a clay pot because nobody cares. You say alabaster pot and people all of a sudden go, ooh, alabaster, ooh. So 
anyway, so he says, we're going to write your name on this pot. And when we reach the amount of money that we need to raise, and I don't remember what the amount was, it was, you know, whatever. And of course, you don't know, you know they could raise 10 times that, just not tell you. But uh, when we reach the amount, when we reach our goal, what we're going to do is we're going to, you're going to smash this pot and Jesus Christ will deliver you from whatever is afflicting you. If you're afflicted by sin, if you're afflicted by poverty, if you're afflicted by bad health, send us your money, get, make a pledge, send your money in. We're going to write your name on this pot and Jesus will smash. Uh, would you, would you, when we smash this pot, Jesus will smash the chains that are holding you back in life. Uh, imagine, imagine, imagine Jesus Christ in heaven, chewing his fingernails down to the down to the quick, wondering if you, dear listener, are going to send your three hundred bucks in so that he will then be at liberty to deliver you. And there's a lot of different psychological. Uh, Things that go into into that that whole setup. I mean, I mean, there's you know what happens if I wait too long to call in and give my money and they smash the pot and I miss the chance to get delivered. Nonsense, hogwash. People ought to be horse whipped. And Jesus Christ doesn't work that way. When Jesus Christ delivers a man from sin, he delivers him completely. When he delivers a man from leprosy, he delivers him completely. Uh, uh, you 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 get saved. All your sins are gone. They don't they're not gradually removed. The power of sin in your life may still be there. The effects of sin, your life, consequences of that sin may still be there, but the sin themselves are gone by the testimony of one who cannot lie. Verse uh, 43, and he straightly charged him and forthwith sent him away and said to him, see thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. And uh, so here we have an odd thing. So there's a process involved under the, under the law, under the, under the Old Testament law. There's a process involved in getting rid of leprosy. Because obviously prior to uh, Jesus Christ manifesting himself on the earth, uh, you had lepers walking around. And there's a whole procedure for how to get clean from that thing, how to, how to, how to, how, for how that should be dealt with. I won't say for how to get clean from it, because that's a whole other subject. But let's look at... Leviticus 13, I'm going to do a little bit of reading here. We could just hit the high points, but it's good, to, it's good to read the Bible out loud. Leviticus 13. You say, what does this matter? Well, all this stuff's important. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying, When a man shall have in the skin of his flesh... A rising, a scab, a bright spot. If it be in the skin of his flesh like the plague of leprosy, that he should be brought unto Aaron the priest, or unto one of his sons the priest. And the priest shall look on the plague in the skin of the flesh. And when the hair of the plague is turned white, and the plague in sight be deeper than the skin of his flesh, it is the plague of leprosy. It is a plague of leprosy. And the priest shall look upon him, or look on him, and pronounce him unclean. Okay? So, if you have this skin condition, they bring you to the priest. The priest looks at it, and the priest goes, yep, that's leprosy. Uh, if the bright spot be white in the skin of his flesh, and his sight be not deeper than the skin, and the hair thereof be not turned white, then the priest shall shut him up that hath the plague seven days. The priest shall look on him the seventh day, and behold, if the plague in his sight be at a stay, or if the plague spread not in the skin, then the, the priest shall shut him up seven days more. So apparently you can have a really mild case of leprosy, as long as, you know, they just keep an eye on it and come back in a week and, and take a look at it, and, uh, and, and, and you know, you're, you're okay from there. But if that's not what happens... Then they got to deal with it. Uh, verse seven: If the scab spread much abroad in the skin after he hath been seen the priest for his cleansing, he should be seen the priest again. And the priest see that, behold, the scab spreadeth in the skin. Then the priest shall proclaim him unclean, or pronounce him unclean. It is a leprosy. The plague of the leprosy is in a man. Then he should be brought unto the priest, and the priest shall see him. And behold, if the rising be white in the skin, if he turn the hair white, and there be quick raw flesh in the rising, it is an old leprosy in the skin of his flesh. And the priest shall pronounce him unclean. He shall not shut him up, for he is unclean. And if the leprosy break out abroad in the skin, the leprosy cover all the skin of him that hath the plague from his head unto his foot. Wheresoever the priest looketh, then the priest shall consider. And behold, the leprosy have covered all his flesh. He pronounce him clean that hath the plague. It is turned white. He is clean. <laughs> and this goes on and on and on over all these different scenarios, all these different things. But the basic idea is, you go to the priest. The priest looks and goes, yep, it's leprosy. And they shut you up and they check on you in a week. 
See if you're getting better. If you're getting better, then they handle it one way. If you're getting worse, they handle it a different way. Now, there doesn't appear to be a whole lot of stuff in the scriptures about leprosy actually being healed by the priest. Uh, but there, you're, you're supposed to go to the priest uh, to contain the plague sort of thing. But anyway, my point in all this was um, you know, the idea is the priest looks at you and, and, and if you're getting better and you're no longer contagious, then you're good to go. And if not, they shut you up and they look at you again later. So my point is that the priests in the in an area knew who the lepers were. I mean, everybody could look you lepers. Leprosy is something you can see, uh, especially when it gets in its advanced stages. And so the, but the priests, in their capacity as priests, knew who the lepers were. Now, I don't know that this guy uh, that's talking to Jesus here in Mark 1 had been the priest at all. Well, I don't know. It just doesn't say. You could, you could say he did. You could say he didn't. I don't know. Uh, but that's not the point. Look at look, look at Leviticus 14. I don't know why I turned out of Leviticus. But Leviticus 14, just a, just a few verses past where, uh, there we are, 14, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought unto the priest, and the priest shall go forth out of the camp, and the priest shall look, and behold, the plague of leprosy be healed in the leper. Then the priest shall command to take for him that is to be cleansed two birds alive and clean in cedar wood and scarlet and hyssop. And the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. And as for the living bird, he shall take it in the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssop and shall dip them in the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. And shall sprinkle upon him that is to be cleansed from the leprosy seven times and shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bird loose into the open field. And he that is to be cleansed shall wash his clothes and shave off all his hair and to wash himself in water that he may be clean. And after that, he shall come into the camp, and shall tear brought out of his tent seven days. And it goes on and on and on and on. And then in the verse 10, And the eighth day he shall take two he lambs without blemish, and one ewe lamb of the first year without blemish, and three-tenth deals of fine flour for a meat offering, mingled with oil, and one log of oil. And the priest that maketh him clean shall present the man that is to be made clean and those things before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the priest shall take one of the he, one he lamb and offer him for a trespass offering and the log of oil and wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. He shall slay the lamb in the place where he shall kill the sin offering and the burnt offering in the holy place. For as the sin offering is the priest, so is the trespass offering in his most holy. And the priest shall take some of the blood of the trespass offering and the priest shall put it upon the tip of the right ear of him that is to be cleansed. And it goes on for a long... Anyway, so my, my point is my point is all this is that... Um, once a man was clean, uh, there was a sacrifice that had to be offered, a sacrifice of, of, of praise. And it is remarkably similar to the sacrifice offered for sins, even called the sin offering and the trespass offering, because leprosy is, is a type of, of sin in, in, in the life of someone. So even though the priest had... Uh, uh, so once a man's clean, there's, there's a sacrifice that has to be offered. And a big show was made of the fact that this guy was now clean. He had sort of uh, reintroduced into the community. You see this in the back half of, of Leviticus 14. So even though the priest had little to no part in the actual man getting healed, um, like I said, I don't even know if this guy had even been to see the priest. Jesus tells this leper to go do the, the uh, for lack of a better word, the closing ceremony. Go present yourself to the priest. The priest obviously knew who he was because the priest knew who the lepers were. The priest would know when that guy showed up who now has no leprosy. The priest would know this guy did not do what the usual procedure is for this leprosy situation. And yet here he is. He's obviously, we can see that he's clean. So Jesus tells him to go do the, the, the you know, I'm going to call it the closing ceremony, for lack of a better word. And that offering was a thanks to God, and God still deserved to be thanked. Either way, whether you do it the Old Testament way or whether you do it the Jesus healed you way, God still deserved to be thanked. So here's an analogy. So let's say a guy goes to the doctor and he finds out that he has uh, terminal cancer and he doesn't show up for any of the treatments. And then one day he shows up and he's cancer free. I mean, it looks like that's the situation here. Jesus tells a man who had not been healed by the Levitical priesthood to go show the Levitical priesthood that he had been saved, or that he'd been, that he'd been cleansed, he'd been healed. By showing himself to the priest, he gets himself taken off the... Uh, you know, the leper list, I guess, or whatever you call it. But the priests know that, they, that he didn't do it. That's why the Bible says it's a, for a testimony 
unto them. This guy shows up and he's cleansed of leprosy. And they say, well, how did this happen? And he and he'll say, Jesus Christ healed me. See the analogy? Jesus Christ washes your sins away, heals you. The high priest of our profession washes your sins away with his own blood. And you're supposed to be a testimony to a lost and dying world, a world that could not fix your sin problem, a world that could not heal you, a world that could not cleanse you. You're supposed to be a testimony to them of what he did on your behalf. Now, here's what you look at verse 44, Mark 1, back to Mark 1. Mark 1, uh, uh, l- 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 let me say this, uh, everything, when you go through that whole thing in Leviticus 13 about the diagnosis of leprosy and the way it's handled, and you go into everything about the Leviticus 14 about once the, once the leprosy is dealt with, uh, all the stuff that happens after that, when you can go into all that stuff, everything in your Old Testament, uh, in the ceremony law and, and dietary, all, all that stuff, all that stuff is not just there for no reason. That stuff is there, according to uh, according to Galatians and some other places, uh, to to uh, to point to Jesus Christ, and all that stuff was done so particularly and so precisely, and every single element has a a significance in pointing to Jesus Christ. Having said that, I sometimes cannot figure out for the life of me what the significance of some of these things are, but I do know this: that leper. I may not be able to explain to you the significance of the hyssop and the cedar and the and the and the and the, and the, and the blood kill the bird killed over running water and I, I don't know what that stuff's important. It must be because it is so precisely laid out. But I, uh, yeah, I don't know. But I will say this: one of the things that that really jumps out to anybody that's paying attention is that the in the under that Levitical system, the priest has to declare you clean. You can't declare yourself clean. The priest has to declare you clean. And Jesus Christ is the high priest of our profession, declares a man saved, declares a man righteous, declares a man clean, and he's the only one that can do it. And so that's part of that that's part of that really uh, interesting analogy. But anyway, in verse 44, Jesus Christ, I think this is funny. Maybe maybe you maybe you'll think it's dumb of me to zero in on something like this, but if you've listened to it for this long, if you listen to this uh, podcast for more than you know, about five seconds. You'll know that I say lots of dumb things that are amusing to me that aren't amusing to anybody else. In verse 44, Jesus Christ gives this guy three commands, okay? Here we go. See thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. So he's supposed to say nothing to anybody, supposed to leave Jesus, go right to the priest, show himself to the priest, and offer the sacrifice. Those are three things. Say nothing, show yourself to the priest, offer the sacrifices. I don't know if he did the last two, but he definitely ignored the first one. The point where you say nothing to anybody, he ignored that part. The Bible says in the very next verse, but he went out and began to publish it much and to blaze abroad. That's a great phrase, blaze abroad. To blaze abroad the matter, insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city and was without in desert places, and they came to him from every quarter. So Jesus, at the end of this verse, at the end of chapter 1, he cannot even go into town because he'll be mobbed by people that need him, his, want his attention, need his attention. He has to stay outside of town. Even with him staying outside of town in a desert place where there's no place to eat and no place to sleep and no place to, to you know get out, of the, get out of the elements, even with that going on, people still found him. Uh, and... And like I said, this is just maybe just me being me, but it is interesting to me. So we're going to say that this guy, this this leper, is the, is in typology, a uh, typology of a man who had just gotten saved. He had came to Jesus Christ. He understood his condition. He didn't come uh, with his uh, uh, high-mindedness. He didn't come with his self-righteousness. Uh, he didn't come saying, you get this started and I'll finish it. He came to Jesus Christ and said, if thou wilt, thou can make me clean. And Jesus Christ says, I will be thou clean. And that's the same thing that happened to you. You come to Jesus Christ broken. You come to Jesus Christ acknowledging your sin. You come to Jesus Christ as your Savior. He'll save you. He'll deliver you. He'll wash you. He'll make you clean. And so if I can just just give me some liberty here to refer to this leper as a baby Christian, 
But it's interesting to me that the first thing this baby Christian did, what well, in his zeal, the first thing he did was disobey the one who delivered him. And what's interesting is that Jesus didn't undeliver him. Like he leaves, this guy runs his mouth to everybody. And you can say, well, maybe he did all this talking after he got healed. Maybe. But that's not the way, that's not the order of events that's laid out in Scripture. But Jesus didn't undeliver him just because he was being an idiot. Just because he didn't, couldn't, he, he had one job. Or technically he had three jobs. But he had one job and he didn't do that very well. Jesus, his liberty just didn't come back. So what does that mean? Well, I think it means, among other things, it means lots of things. But one of the things it means is Jesus is prepared to be disappointed with you. It's not an excuse for sin, but it's just, just a simple acknowledgement that whatever songs you might have heard, heaven is not counting on you. And Jesus is not counting on you. Jesus has no particular confidence in you or in me. And he is prepared to be disappointed by us at every turn. Because that is the legacy of human beings, is disappointment. I'm not, if you disappoint, that's not okay. But it is not the it's not the end of the world. That you pick yourself up, you dust yourself off, you get it right, and you keep on trucking. I mean, what is the alternative? You've let down the Lord today, maybe. I've let down the Lord today, maybe. And so I can either I can either you know curl up in a ball and cry about it and 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 commend myself on what a failure I am, or I can keep going. And I think it's worth noting that this guy failed. He failed with good intentions. Because what he did is he, he didn't go, you know, Ooh, I'm delivered from leprosy. Now I can go, you know, whatever he was planning on doing. That man, once he was delivered from leprosy, he went around and told everybody about how Jesus had delivered him. So I would say, if you're going to blow it, I mean, blow it like that, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. So he cleansed that leper. The Bible says that the Son should make you free, you should be free indeed. When Jesus Christ cleansed that leper, he cleansed the leper because he wanted to. It was his will to. And he did so, he was motivated by, by compassion towards the guy who could not help himself, who was living a life and suffering the consequences of sin, not only in his own life, but in the, in, in, in the life of his countrymen, in the life of his society. He had gotten wrapped up and caught up in the consequences of the sin of his society. And Jesus did not condemn him. Jesus had compassion on him. He, he healed him, and he did it completely. And he did that uh, after a man who, he did that because the man understood his condition, and he understood he couldn't fix it to himself. And that man came to him in humility, and so he got healed. And that is, in typology, the same deal you got. And man, what a deal, what a deal, what a deal. Because he was out in desert places, and they came to him from every quarter. Man, when the life of Jesus Christ, the demands of the people seemed like they never stopped. And uh, that's how that works. Well, folks, believe it or not, we have actually made it to the end of Mark chapter 1. And it only took, you know, 13 lessons or whatever. Um, thank you for those of you that have stuck it through. We're going to get into uh, 2, and 2 is, uh, two is an interesting thing. Uh, yeah. So thank you for listening. This is Michael. This has been the Street Preachers Podcast. And I will see you as always on the other side.